So this morning we have gone through some further points in relation to essential practice of dharma. Some new ones may wonder why we are taking so much time with those explanations, why don't we come to the point or in the practice of meditation or something like this is called meditation week, so we are not meditating. That's because our habitual inadequate to inadequate idea of meditation, we may think like that. Meditation means we have to sit still, we cannot talk anymore, and uh, close the eyes or I don't open the eyes or something like that. I suppose close the eyes, so mostly. <laughs> so some special position. So if we are not in such a position, then we think we are not meditating, which is not actually the case. And stop talking. Now this is not happening so <laughs> here easily because I am very talkative. I mean, uh, that's a joke, but uh, in um, reality, when one really wants mind, meditation is, as uh, this morning also I've been explaining, there's our mental world, there's our mental world. So as long as our mind stays in the context of the Dharma and not going totally out of the context into all kinds of involvements, but stays within the context of the Dharma, paying attention to the meaning of the Dharma and uh, try to understand, try to integrate within one's own mind the teaching of the Dharma. That constitutes a very important meditation. Meditation is not uh, limited only to a single-pointed concentration which is also an aspect of the meditation, but especially uh, that which gives and opens our mind, that which gives understanding, which helps us to develop wisdoms and those virtuous qualities in the mind, comes not just through single-pointed meditation, but through analytical meditation. For what we are doing together is already an Analytical meditation, as long as you are paying attention, you are following these points of the Dharma and try to integrate them within one's own mind. And the speaker also, not just speaking like that and out of completely uh, distracted mind, but also keeping the mind in the context of the Dharma and also try to generate some motivation and also then try to the explanations of the Dharma, then that engagement is also meditation. So therefore, for the speaker, listener, all together, when our mind is first of all in the right uh, mindset, that means right motivation. And secondly, one is uh, deeply with a deep interest and aspiration is there. And then one is um, eager to learn and understanding the important points of Dharma, which means important points of one's own situation. And then we all manage altogether to a very important meditation. Sometimes the realizations, the understanding that comes about through such kind of interaction becomes much more meaningful and much more awakening much more enriching for ourselves than sitting alone and try to meditate or think about certain points. Meditation and teaching and also meditation and praying, all these are not separate things. Meditation, very often people have this limited view that one has to sit still, absolutely quiet and so on. That's one method of meditation, for certain meditation, but equally the, all the teaching and listening of the Dharma and uh, also our recitation and prayers, all these are meditation. Uh, recitation and the prayers is not only simply reciting something like a parrot, but one has to, his prayers, this recitation should be an expression of what goes on in one's mind. It should be an expression of faith, expression of that kind of faith of devotion, faith of devotion, or a faith of confidence, or taking refuge, or generating really a universal compassion to all sentient beings. 
and our prayers are nothing else than expression of those. But those things has to generate in one's mind. And with the generation of them in our mind, if we also utter them in words that fulfills a real prayer, if one does it, that is very important meditation. With a broader, if one understands meditation in its in a broader sense, then all such activities becomes meditation. This kind of exchange of giving teaching and listening to the teaching and at the same time one's mind is fully engaged with the subjects of the teaching, integrating everything, not you know, listening to the teaching as somebody is giving a description about something else. But all the teaching of Dharma is actually always focused upon oneself, one's own situation, pointing to one's own situation. Fully enlightened Buddha Shakyamuni, he, when he gave his first teaching of the Four Noble Truths, he said, like, this is the noble truth of the suffering, or this is the noble truth of the cause. He didn't say, there is noble truth of the suffering, there is noble truth of the cause. He said, this is, that means pointing to ourselves. So this here means nobody else. This means here, right here. This oneself is the noble truth of the suffering. This is the, actually, the suffering. And this, what is inside ourselves, is this is the very cause of the suffering, that means our delusion. Buddha used always such close words like this, instead of saying, there is the noble truth of suffering, that you should understand, there is the noble truth of the cause, you learn about it or something, he didn't say. He said, directly pointing to ourselves that this is the noble truth of the suffering. So that means it is this very existence, this condition existence, this coming production of ourselves. In other words, this very existence itself is the deepest meaning of the suffering. All other sufferings that we experience, such as physical, mental sufferings, is only a symptom which is born out of this base. The base itself exists in the nature of the suffering at the moment. Because this is a karmic production, it is not an existence that we have taken out of one's own full freedom of liberty, chosen, taken for the sake of other sentient beings or whatsoever. We have not taken this existence that way. We have taken this existence, whether it suits or not ourselves, it is somewhat like given, but given does not mean given by anybody, but given by one's own karmic cause, and the production of one's own karma of the past, that way we received it, uh, whether it suits or not. So uh, sometimes we obtain very uh, favorable situation like now, ours, and sometimes we also obtain very miserable situation like many other sentient beings are experiencing. So all that is a uh, karmic production. So therefore our type of existence is still in that conditioned by karma, is a conditioned existence. And that is the very fundamental suffering. So Buddha, and then out on that, then all other aspects of the sufferings and, uh, and so such things are taking place. So therefore Buddha is pointing in the Four Noble Truth, this is the suffering. So this means this very conditioned existence itself is the suffering. So when he speaks what this is the cause of the suffering, this means the, this cause is also not elsewhere, as we have been explaining this morning. We think the cause is elsewhere, but actually it is nowhere else. It is within this very existence, it is right here. That is our own ignorance, our own egoism, our own desire, our own anger, our own jealousy, or this is, or even is more than the, uh, this, these are actually more are the, the causes of suffering, the noble truth of the suffering. All the teachings of Dharma it is nothing else than pointing to ourselves. It is a description of, or more like introducing our own situation to ourselves. As we read always in the life of the Buddha, that disciples come around the Buddha, and through listening to the teaching of Buddha, then some even quite assume 
through you know, following the teaching of Buddha, listening very attentively to the teaching of Buddha, then they attain the state of satopana. Satopana is so-called stream entry state, that is like first uh, like initial state of an Arya way, the way of the Aryas, is attained through listening to the teaching of Dharma. And of course, that does not happen only just uh, simply hearing the sound of the Dharma, that already leaves a very important imprint, even in the animal, listening, hearing the sound of Dharma leaves a very important imprint in one's continuum. But when somebody really follows the teaching, with understanding, attentively paying attention to the meaning of it, then through just paying attention very with a, uh, a mind which is well gathered and integrating those teachings with one's own situation, etc., then even just without necessarily go somewhere else to meditate or something like that, just through listening to the teaching of Dharma, one attains or enters into this satapana state, in this uh, so-called uh, stream entry state. Because it uh, fulfills that kind of listening to the teaching with a concentrated mind and with really sincere mind and proper enthusiasm and so on, then uh, thereby it fulfills a very important practice by itself. So, as a result of it, then one attains even in the very session of the teaching, or the end of the session of the teaching, one attains already such a uh, state, like Sarpana, etc. So, uh, this is because the, the teaching session is very effective, very important for transforming our mind, even if one does not enter into Arya state, but already in one's mind, it will really, really a deep sense of faith in the three rules generates, compassion to the sentient beings generates, and also true attitude of renunciation or this kind of disheartenment about the uh, samsaric life, the samsaric existence generates when some things like this happen, can happen to ourselves by listening to the teaching of Tao. When that happens, then uh, very good results already accomplished. And that comes through such kind of exchange of the Dharma. It does not happen uh, simply by doing nothing or sitting quietly or hiding somewhere. It happened in the life of precious Master Jetsongapa. He was teaching to a group of really extraordinary disciples and uh, on, on the important points about the two truths, and the important point, especially on the ultimate truth, the, uh, the emptiness of inherent existence, etc. Explaining, of course, by such a great master in the most effective way, clear and effective way. And the disciples were also extraordinary. They were right at that very moment, integrating them all in meditation. Then it happened that one of the disciples, a great disciple, Master Sri Senge, was very, as, as the master, uh, goes on explaining all this search of the self, non-self existence of one's own person, and explaining, and he was uh, immediately integrating that in the meditation. So and he reached to the point where and he entered into this kind of ultimate search of uh, this uh, self, that I, and then uh, with the help of the, uh, the, uh, the explanation given by the master and so on, then he really uh, deepened his understanding of it. At some point, then he lost, he, he lost his self. You know. Then there was a big shock. For the serious searcher, it mostly gives a shock. And the serious uh, searcher, then it becomes an interesting thing. <laughs> interesting something. You know, this uh, so-called interesting. Such a serious searcher, then it gave a shock. Then it was really kind of like he lost his self. Then he was shocked that he, he holds himself like this, very um, strongly. And then in this kind of, um, this kind of clothes, this kind of, how do you say, this upper, uh, this upper vest, here, yeah, upper vest. In Tibet, we made them all out of woolen, so it's quite thick, because the Tibet is very cold. So, and, but very often, the monks also keep one needle here for sewing, 
keep the needle under here on this collar, on the collar. Then he grabbed himself, then his needles were pricked him. And then, of course, it, that made him to realize that he's still there. <laughs> yeah, he's still there. And the master seeing, and, and then master saw this, and master says, the color convention, color convention, he said. <laughs> this is the color. He said, color convention. That means, then he, what he lost is this false projection of the self that we have just created in ourselves. We always, all in, uh, in all our lives, and even in this life, from the beginning to until now, we always believe very strongly in the existence of that false self. We think that is me and so on. So, running around, carrying it always, this false self. And then, with the thorough analysis, one finds that this is a total fabrication. It is total projection of one's mind. Nowhere at all you can find this uh, such a self. So that's then gone. Then uh, one really, uh, what one realized is not existence of it, but the lack of it. And that gave a great shock. But it does not mean that we don't exist at all. We still exist. Who is actually, because we exist, then we listen to the Dharma and we understand the meaning and we are able to even able to meditate and search for such kind of things. That the very the concrete, very obvious, uh, seemingly very concrete, very obvious, very uh, kind of independent self is then gone. It's totally lost. That gave a great shock. But then we are still existing in the conventional way, in the relative way. That is still existing, and so that is become clear when he was pricked by the uh, needle and then it caused him some, some, it hurt his finger. That gave him that, that reminded him of his relative existence, really the existing person. Having that veil of this false view, this false reality is gone and then he, uh, that was a big shock. Because our belief in that was too strong and too old. Now that's gone, it's a completely new experience. However, then when he grabbed, and then he realized this conventional reality, the conventional relative existence. So that is what the Master said, the color convention. Color convention, that's here. Convention, your conventional self is here with the color. In your color. So uh, then he fully understood. At this point he had realized fully the emptiness of self-existence with the help of the teaching of the Master. Listening to the teaching of Dharma is the most profitable. That is also the most effective meditation, uh, which gives one the best and clears the realization. Because the authentic teaching of Dharma, or transmission of teaching of Dharma, or by a true recipient, is always seen as a mirror. Through looking in the mirror, then one sees whatever dirt or whatever they are on one's face. If one's makeup is done wrongly, or eyelashes are put wrongly, <laughs> or something, anything like that, without a mirror, one doesn't see that. You know, sometimes maybe a half is hanging, uh, or something like that. One wouldn't see that until we. <laughs> Or the makeup state you know, completely made oneself something very funny. But only with the help of mirror one sees whatever they are on the face. But without a mirror one does not see. So in the same way, that is the, uh, the right way to take Dharma teaching. You see it as a mirror which reflects all our faults. In other words, it is diagnosis of all one's problems. Just as a doctor gives me a precise checkup and they diagnose you have this, this problem, that problem, this problem. Mostly the doctors only indicate problems, nothing <laughs> more. <laughs> so in the same way, Dharma teachings also like the diagnosis of those and fundamental problems. That's what Buddha has taught the Dharma exactly diagnosing our fundamental problems. And that's any teaching of Dharma should be given for that, should be taken for that. And when it's done that, then it's very, very meaningful. It becomes really very, very helpful, very meaningful.
So exactly in that way, one should take the teachings of Rama, it should uh, also uh, should be taken like this, should be given like that. So therefore, Dharma teaching should be completely, should be deprived of all kinds of diplomacy and things like that. It has to come, it has to be the most sincere, most direct and pointing to the, the mistakes and everything. And not only mistakes, pointing to the mistakes as well as the qualities and so on, without exaggeration, without underestimation, and without any kind of diplomacy has to be taught. The real Dharma should be taught. That is the way of the, of the true precious master. But of course, the Dharma can be taught yes, in a, some kind of in a political way or diplomatic in a way of flattering the disciples, flattering the disciples with hope that disciples will be nice with oneself and thereby receive a lot of offerings or something like that. You know, there are there are many kinds of teachers, many ways of teaching, there are many kinds of disciples as well. So therefore, there can be all, there are so many different ways and motivations, reasons for teaching Dharma, ways of teaching Dharma, how one can teach only the good things, only the good things, only the wonderful things, only very fantastic things also. It may be a uh, uh, very uh, pleasant thing to hear, but that does not help because what we need is to correct our fundamental mistakes and also to cure ourselves from all these sufferings and the deeper cause of the suffering in one's mind. And that can only be corrected, can be improved when these are pointed out very or very directly without any kind of diplomacy or any motivation of flattering the listeners or teaching only in accordance with what it pleases the listener. That is unkind way of, uncompassionate way of uh, teaching Dharma. The great masters have teachings only out of their wisdom and compassion, but by no means to please the listeners and so on. That is more for politics and ordinary speeches. So therefore, by doing so, when Dharma transmissions are given in the most earnest and sincere way, and when it's also taken in that way, just as a patient listens to the advice of the doctor, then it fulfills a very important purpose. More than sitting alone somewhere, doing a lot of retreats or meditation. So therefore, the role of the teacher of the Dharma is actually to produce that necessary understanding and wisdom in the minds of the, the listeners. Also, these the necessary realizations, necessary faith, necessary regret, necessary determination to improving, to generate that kind of the necessary attitudes and understanding. For that, this is very important. This is very important. Otherwise, the spiritual guide, dharma teacher, whatever it's called, then it becomes entertainer. Then, uh, as we say in Tibetan, Pangupiu, that means uh, <laughs> the monkey of the beggar. <laughs> monkey of the beggar, the monkey. That means, in other words, in our term, it becomes a circus. It becomes a circus. And we say Pangupiu, that means uh, <laughs> beggar's monkey, beggar's monkey. Now it's uh, now it's forbidden in as group in India the news. But before there are all these uh, monkey beggars go around with the monkeys. The monkeys can do a lot of things and then uh, the uh, through shower uh, the spectator then gives some money and so on. So <laughs> therefore Guru's role becomes like beggar's monkey or circus. And that's not at all the purpose whatsoever. Uh, one should understand you know, currently, the purpose of this kind of exchange of dharma and all this correctly, when one understands correctly, then they become very meaningful, both for the speaker and the listener. What is essential, as I explained this morning, is uh, that the realization, to, to realize that the real source of benefit and happiness, as well as source of sufferings and difficulties, are within one's mind. So therefore, Buddha has emphasized to tame our mind, the, the real causes of happiness, which are also 
to be found within one's own mind, such as contentment, satisfaction, generosity, ethic, and patience, and loving kindness, compassion. All these are or in a higher levels in bodhicitta and the, uh, the perfect view and all those things are a part of our mind. These are something that has to be attained or something that has to generate within one's own mind. We have the potentiality of all these things within ourselves, a potential state, a weak state. And there is always every possibility for us to increase their power, to bring all those things to maturity. So uh, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the past, including Buddha Shakyamuni, all the great masters of the past, all, they were not right from the beginning, uh, are endowed with all these qualities, perfect way. Instead, just like ourselves, and sometimes, at some point, even weaker than ourselves, went through such a situation. However, through their efforts and through their uh, the unmistaken and proper motivations, and developing the attitudes and uh, through following the right means they have finally completely promoted all those the most precious potentialities in them to a perfect level. Uh, by that they have become a true refuge and guide of all sentient beings. Therefore it's very very interesting and uh, inspiring read the previous lives of the Buddhas like the uh, Bodhisattva lives of the Buddhas where Buddha very clearly you know, pointed out what faults he had, he also had attachment, he had anger, he had all those other regular things as we all, and thereby also did things which are incorrect, etc., many times. But at the same time, then also, these the negative potentialities, such as all the delusions, were all just as it is so uh, manifest and strong in our mind now, in the same way it has been like that also for the Buddha in many past existence. However, then going through that necessary change and bringing up that change in their mind through by seeing those, those faults, recognizing them, then applying the adequate antidote and that way weakening them and finally completely eradicating them and through promoting, increasing the power of positive potentialities then they have become so-called fully enlightened. If one takes up the right action then it is, it is the very nature of the phenomena that anybody applying the right methods can overcome all these the delusions how strong they may appear, how dominant they may appear and all be overcome, all be eliminated, and also these weak potentialities like weak compassion and weak patience and weak concentration, whatsoever, these things which are in such a state now also can be developed and increased infinitely. That is the very nature of the mind, it is the nature of phenomena itself that this happens. But of course, for that one has to bring the, uh, the necessary and cause and conditions together. So this all depends upon one's own determination and one's own action. Now if we take the life of the famous great yogi Milarepa, is very well known, great Tibetan guru, great master, but uh, he started off not at all as a holy person or like that, he was a criminal because of uh, the, his mother and himself as a child suffered great injustice, uh, very mistreated by the uncle after the death of the father. Then Milarepa and his mother, they suffered very much under the, uh, the uncle and so on. So therefore she, the mother, couldn't stand it at all. So therefore it was the mother's wish that Milarepa goes and learn black magic. And so, which he did, very, uh, he's a very, very determined, very um, hardworking person, not at all somebody lazy. So therefore, he very well accomplished those powers under certain gurus, and that way, then he was very powerful, and he used them against all those uncles and so forth, and annihilated them. 
her, the whole family, ruining the whole family altogether. So it was quite a criminal.